I feel like it's been so long since I've seen you guys. But There's one more sheet down there. <laughs> like... Okay, first item on the agenda is the... Hello. First item on the agenda is the review and approval of the meeting notes that came today. If any, or yesterday, I'm losing track. If anybody wants to hold off, we can hold off or we can approve them this evening. You want to make a motion? I, I will make a motion uh, that we uh, approve the minutes as written. Um, I would ask there's a clerical error. Us. Uh, Sean's name is misspelled on the last page. So if you could fix that, <laughs> that would be great. Other, is there a second? Second. Any other comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Next item is the review of current design concepts, and I want to turn it over to Scott. Thank you, Chairman Sedaris. We'll get right into our presentation. The the building committee charged us with taking a look at a number of things in the month of December subsequent to the last meeting. So we have quite a bit to cover. We'll try to cover it quickly, certainly. We, um, we're here to answer any questions as we move through the presentation. I, I want to start by saying that when uh, the, the charge from this committee was for us to evaluate the potential advantages of a all new Cunniff Elementary School and an all new Hosmer Elementary School, and then a fresh look at the law to determine if in fact the, um, the West addition there was appropriately cited, could be adjusted, some other considerations at law could be made so that that portion of the building didn't encroach um, so closely to the property edge on the west side. We took a look at all of those things, but the, the opportunity to do the Cunniff and the Hosmer as all new requires a fresh look at all three projects um, to determine what all the potential advantages were. And one of the first things we saw was that if those two projects are going to be all new construction, then does some kind of adjustment in the enroll proposed enrollment at each school make any sense? Um, because a slight adjustment down for the proposed enrollment at Lowell, we found, did a lot to improve the program there um, and to make more spaces available for use. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. And if we, in looking at it, if we took those same students and divided them equally and placed them at the Cunniff and the Hosmer respectively, it really didn't impact the size much of the addition of the new construction at the Cunniff and the Hosmer. So we're going to be looking at that tonight. It certainly um, is an adjustment in what we've talked about, about for proposed enrollment. So we did just sort of touch base with Chairman Sedaris and Superintendent, Superintendent of Schools to just make, we touch base with Didi to make sure that um, it was at least something we could take a look at. And so we're presenting that tonight, not as, um, you know, anything final or anything we've gotten any approval on, but we think it definitely warrants some consideration by this building committee and certainly by the school committee. So we're going to pre present those numbers um, tonight. It will review what those slight adjustments that we would at least propose you consider would be, and then we'll talk about the advantages they present, not just to the schools, but to the site layouts and the neighborhoods, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll talk about that in the presentation. As, as a reminder, we've listed the previously proposed enrollments for each of the three elementary schools. So if you look at the second uh, yellow column from the left, where we've got the 345, the 750, and the 550 for the three schools respectively, just as a reminder, um, 
we were previously working with and the enrollment of 345 pupils for the CUNF, 550 K-5 students for the Hosmer plus 200 preschool pre-K students for a total of 750 and then 550 students at the low. And also as a reminder, in terms of what that means for general classrooms, if you look at the second column from the right, you'll see that that means at the CUNF we were previously talking about 18 general classrooms with two flex classrooms. At the Hosmer and the Lowell respectively, we were talking about 28 general classrooms with two flex classrooms. And then at the Hosmer, you'll recall, we've always been talking about 13 preschool pre-K classrooms to accommodate that enrollment of approximately 200 students. So this adjustment, if, if, it, if it was to be adopted, that we're going to talk a little bit about tonight, is over on the currently proposed side. And you can see it's only adjustment of two additional classrooms at the CUNF and then two additional classrooms at the Hosmer, but it allows us to reduce the number of classrooms at the low by four. And you can see with the flex classrooms added what those total enrollments would be. It, it, uh, it keeps the kind of below 400 at 385 proposed. Um, the Hosmer would go from 750 to 790, and the Law would go from 550 down to 470. Um, and we'll talk about why those might make a lot of sense. Just as a reminder, at points in time, although it's not a driving factor, at points in time, We've talked about what that would mean in terms of the number of classrooms per grade. So we've just included here a summary of what that would, would mean. Um, at the Lowell, it would mean four classrooms per grade. At the Hosmer, it would mean five classrooms per grade. And then at the Cunniff, it would mean three classrooms per grade plus the two floating general classrooms. Any, any questions around that? Because I know that's a, a new item to see. Slide adjustment across the board, and we'll, we'll talk about the advantages and dis disadvantages. Steve? Uh, Scott, one of the concerns we had before in terms of attendance zones was if we reduce the CONIF and, I mean, enlarge the CONIF and reduce the law, that the attendance zone for the CONIF would, in effect, go past law. Um, and I don't know if you looked at that at all in terms of uh, this rebalancing of the numbers. We don't, we don't have definitive information on what that line of demarcation between the two neighborhoods would be. Certainly already at the CUNF, there is a, a growing enrollment. It's the one that over the last few years seemed to have increased the most. So it felt to us like it was certainly a possibility. But we can look at what that line is and work with um, the school department to determine if, in, in fact, that would be created. Any other questions on these two pages? Okay, Scott. Just, just talking first a little bit about the kind of site and the, I want to start by just summarizing. We can talk about them in more detail, obviously, but on the kind of site, once we go to new construction, it certainly increases the amount of outdoor open space on the site, which was a big concern of the neighborhood and the abutters and certainly has also been a concern of this committee. Uh, the new construction helps us reduce the size of the building footprint, um, even though it would accommodate slightly more students' overall building footprint um, is very consistent with what the current building footprint would, is and certainly significantly smaller than what the footprint with an addition as we had proposed would be. It reduces the amount of exterior building envelope and just a reminder as we talk about reducing exterior building envelope, we're talk, anything we do to reduce that exterior building envelope is increasing operational efficiency, reducing maintenance costs. Or there are all kinds of benefits associated with that. It improves the overall organizational layout just in terms of the, the academic layout for the building. Certainly, if we can start from scratch and we're going to show you 
um, a proposed layout for that site and for the building. It eliminates the disadvantages of existing to remain classrooms. We talked on a number of occasions how if we did the addition at the Cunniff, we would propose that the existing classrooms in the, in the 50s building be maintained and continue to be utilized, but they were slightly undersized and it was a little bit challenging to make those um, consistent with and provide parity between those and the new classrooms. It's certainly going to improve the overall building energy use and efficiency. Um, it puts us in a realm where we can start talking about uh, the potential for either being net zero or certainly net zero emerging um, as a design goal. And as a reminder, net zero um, in kind of the simplest form would mean that we generate enough energy, alternative energy on site to offset the, um, the cost, the operational cost from a utility standpoint for the building by utilizing, in this case, um, solar energy. And net zero versus net zero emerging, net zero emerging um, would mean that we set up the entire building ready for those solar panels at a certain efficiency. Um, net zero would mean the actual installation, execution, et cetera, um, and testing and proving a year out that it did in fact produce as much, um, make as much energy as it produced. Um, and then it would allow us to target uh, lead certification, uh, potentially lead silver, lead gold in a certifiable mode. It still would be up to this committee to decide if you wanted to pursue that actual certification, but certainly we would follow the roadmap and the scorecard for getting there if we were going to do an all new construction building. And we, we can't emphasize enough, and we'll, we'll talk about this on all the projects obviously, we can't emphasize en enough the, what a game changer it would be should the building committee um, and the town elect to go this route of new construction. There are going to be a lot of advantages to the, the process if the, if the town um, decides to go that direction. Just as a reminder, this was the renovation addition preferred schematic scheme that we printed, presented to this building committee on a couple of occasions. It's the one that we presented to the neighborhoods for the public meetings and the feedback that we received from them. The most significant criticism of this scheme was the fact that with the addition it took up a significant part of the site, green space was reduced, overall open space was reduced. I think everybody appreciated the fact that it was probably the best possible solution if you were going to do renovation and addition on this site, but there was a lot of concern around the amount of green space and open space that it displaced with the addition uh, shown in white. Also some concern about the amount of parking, but that was more of a result of all of this green space and open space on the site being taken up. And so as we began to evaluate possible scenarios for how we'd utilize the site in a new construction fashion, we have this diagram and it's a little bit confusing. Um, it's not intended to be confusing, but it's very helpful if we explain and show a lot of information on the same drawing. So for that reason, it's, it's going to be a little confusing. But we would like you to see the dotted line here because that represents the preferred schematic scheme that we reviewed with this building committee and that we presented to the neighborhood meetings. Um, you can see how much of the site it displaced. And so it's important to see that line. And then also keep in mind that even without that addition, the existing building footprint comes right along this line, turns back here, goes along this edge, and comes back, sort of encompasses the courtyard. If we go to all new three-story construction, we can do a building that abuts the, um, the cemetery property line. And why did we choose that line? Just because it's kind of the most challenging topography as it wraps around the back and then comes back around this side. Um, it's also, it also pulls it away from the site and opens up the remainder of the site in the most significant way. So we're just showing 
that a three-story building mass in this location could accommodate the entire program. There are a few things that we're showing on here that are slightly changed versus other times when we've talked about this site. One is we are proposing that we extend the drop-off lane um, on Warren Street. In fact, we are currently investigating um, the um, Watertown does in fact own the property that would allow extension of this drop-off lane even further. We're, we're trying to verify what the possibilities might be to bring that back even more slightly and extend it more right up uh, perhaps to the property line edge for the turnout to start there. We also think that there could be a lot of advantages if we consider service access coming from the building from the rear of the site. There aren't that many um, service trips to this building. It's a small elementary school. Um, and reviewing the number of deliveries they receive, they're very minimal. So this would receive very, very little traffic. And we think by taking the service area and moving it to the rear of the building, it leaves us more green space, more freedom in front of the school, more open space in front of the school, less of a service dock or service area on the main facade or one of the primary facades of the building. You can see the amount of green space that starts to open up because if we just maintained the existing double loaded parking, which is going to be the most efficient approach to parking on the site, even if we had a turnaround at the end of that lot, which we're sort of showing here, and we had a partial basketball court, for example, that overlapped that turnaround, we can still get 50 plus or minus spaces on the site just in the parking footprint that you see in that location. Now on this site um, and, and everything else, we're sort of proposing that the main entry to this building would be on this corner because if the drop off occurs here and there's a significant number of walkers to the site, it makes sense that you still be able to enter the building as close to Warren Street as possible. Um, and so we still think that an entry right off the street coming up um, the incline in that location and then being able to come right into the main entry in this location makes sense. We could certainly have a secondary community access point in this location and other access points around the building, but we think it makes sense to keep the primary access point um, in that location. We explored a lot of scenarios and we're, we, we aren't going to go through them all tonight. We could certainly um, discuss them at a subsequent meeting if the committee would like to see them. We discussed and tested a lot of scenarios for parking. You could argue that you place this parking closer to the building, for example, but then you have to keep in mind that the drive really needs to come from this corner, get over to the parking, and get you turned around and come back, which presented a lot more pavement area, a lot more impervious area, so it was eating away at more of the green space. We explored the possibility of taking the parking across the front of the site, but by the time you do that, you also have to make a circular loop, and all of the lots that we tested under that scenario um, sort of came to an imaginary line, if you will, out in here and covered this entire area. So ultimately, if open space and green space is the priority, this was the most efficient way to get 50 plus or minus parking spaces on the site, get a turnaround in, and get some hard surface play. So that's the reason we're presenting this proposed site plan sketch. Uh, I'll certainly answer any questions associated with that site plan. I know it's kind of a confusing drawing, so if there's anything in there that is not clear, happy to respond to that as well. I think we should wait until okay. we should okay. the next All right, perfect. couple of designs which would clarify. With, with this scenario, it's, it's important to point out in, in this diagram, although it's intended to just gen, uh, demonstrate generally how the project would be phased, um, it's fairly straightforward. But it does also help to give you a sense. You can see just by looking at the scale of it that this new building, although it's significantly larger in three stories, 
um, is approximately the si same size and mass as this current building, and yet it pulls itself back and kind of opens up a lot more site area than the current building. That's obviously because of where the addition had to occur in the in in the 90s to the um, the existing 50s building. It just in ge in general, in terms of the way the building would be phased for this particular project, the assumption is these students would be moved out of the building entirely and placed at the Hosmer building when the new building there was complete. So we'd have the 53,000 square feet of space to de demolish. We're assuming that's about three months. Uh, new construction for a building of this size, we're assuming about 11 months. And the follow-up site work um, is probably three months or so, depending on the season and depending on exactly when the projects start and the, the sequence of the projects. In the, in the proposed floor plan for that location on the site, there are a couple of what, what we think are kind of interesting and unique opportunities. If we do locate the gymnasium on this end of the proposed building, we think it might give us an opportunity to locate the lowest floor level of that gym at a basement level, if you will. Um, a gym is probably the only space in the building where we don't really want any windows for the first 10 feet or so as a result of its function. And so if we took that two-story volume and for the first floor we pushed it below grade, and the, the borings uh, that have been, geotechnical borings that have been done demonstrate that we, we could potentially do that, then it also works to give us more floor area above that to utilize. So if we let the gym exist at a basement level and then a first floor level, because it's sort of a two-story volume, if you imagine, it is a more efficient use of the overall building. You know, some people in the neighborhood meetings talked about, oh, um, you know, could we put the building on stilts? Could we lift it up? Could we park under it? All of those things are very expensive, but sinking this gym one floor does the same kind of thing, if you can imagine. It allows us to stack program above it where you normally wouldn't have program above it. So when we look at that first floor plan, and this is the entry level for the building. So this is coming into the building on the current floor level of the existing building. If we look at that floor plan, you essentially, if you came in the secondary access or what we're calling the community access point of the building, and you were standing in this vestibule, you would be looking perhaps through a set of windows into that gymnasium and you would be seeing the upper section of the gymnasium and you would go down some stairs to that lower entry level of the gymnasium. So that's what is being proposed. Certainly you could not do that and just bring it up to grade level. It just pushes all of the program space above it, up a floor, but we think it might make sense. With this scenario and this size building, one of the really nice things about this building footprint is it allows us for the proposed Cunniff enrollment to locate two um, classrooms per floor, or two grade levels per floor. So you can see grade one, the three classrooms that I mentioned earlier are located there along with the three kindergarten classrooms that I mentioned earlier in that control point where you've got administration monitoring the street and also monitoring all the entry in kind of an ideal, lots of administrative eyes on the street in the entry area is a nice scenario, allows us to do a secured uh, vestibule entry in a lot of different fashions. It would allow, meaning there are several different strategies we could employ here for multiple secure checkpoints coming into the building. It allows us, once we come through the building, to perhaps have some transparency right out the back of the building um, with a stairway on each end of this proposed floor going upstairs. It's a relatively simple floor plan, but there are a lot of real advantages in what it generates programmatically and the opportunities it generates programmatically. On the second floor, We could have media center, we could have 
uh, student dining now above that gymnasium um, as, a, as a space over that. The, um, we're still working on the grading for the building, meaning the exterior site contours, but keep in mind that this part of the site is up higher than, excuse me, the remainder of the site. So when we talked about that service access coming into the building, there's a real possibility that that service access could come in on this floor level in this corner of the site, um, which would be very convenient and would make a lot of sense for the custodial service um, area there. And we're showing a service elevator in that location for that reason, and then flanking the building on each end, like I said, with the media center and the student dining. And then again, we get the opportunity to place two grade levels on this floor with three classrooms per grade. And then on the upper level, similar configuration. We've stacked the art and music on one end. We've got the student collaboration and common space on the opposite end. And then we've got the second floor of the student dining coming up um, in the back so that that could be a two-story volume with a really compact footprint overall. And just from a massing standpoint, we're giving you a sense of that building on the site. Now, one of the things that would come along with considering a net zero building and even an energy efficient building is a lot of the exterior aesthetic gets driven by window placement, size and configuration of windows, reducing the amount of window fenestration on the east and west, increasing it slightly on the north and south, making sure we have windows that run from floor to ceiling so that we cast natural light as far as we can into the building, making sure we have a large surface area um, to either employ a large solar array um, at the very beginning or to make it available so that that could be deployed easily in the future. It means making sure we've got significant overhangs in the areas where we do have, where we are trying to protect against the heat gain from the sun. So there are characteristics associated with a very energy efficient building um, and certainly with a potentially net zero building that will come with the design of the building. And so we're, we're modeling this as if some of those assumptions would be in place. And as, as part of our presentation, we've included a couple of, I think a couple of buildings um, in the Commonwealth and maybe a couple outside of the Commonwealth that are net zeros, not because we're saying, you know, this is your building or this is a solution, but we want you to see that there is a certain aesthetic. For example, this building is the new fisheries and wildlife headquarters in Westboro. And they're doing a lot of the things that I just mentioned. Um, these ha this, these, this building happens to have um, these roofs intentionally sloped so that the panels on them don't have to be sloped. They've, they've struck a nice angle to minimize the angle that the solar panels have to be on to directly address uh, the best possible um, solar gain. And so you don't necessarily have to do that, but that's a characteristic of a lot of the buildings. You can see the deep overhangs. You can see the tall vertical windows um, to throw the natural daylighting well into the spaces. I think we've got some interior shots of this building also. It kind of opens itself up as um, very energy efficient buildings or net zero buildings often do on one side to bring natural daylight well into the building. We're showing the floor plan of this particular building to give you a sense of what that window wall right there is doing. It's attempting to throw natural daylight as far as possible into this kind of common zone of the central of the building. Here you can see some more examples of that same building and some of the things they've employed um, in order to be environmentally and energy conscious with the building. And now we're going to talk about the Hosmer side a little bit. Should, Mr. Chairman, uh, through you, do you want to pause it? Yeah, let's stop, if we can, the questions on the Hosmer side. I'm coming. That kind of side, I'm sorry, Tom. Um, one of my concerns is by putting the gym below grade, 
is um, that gym is usually used for voting. So we have any other alternative for voting because I think it would be, um, you know, a handicap for people with disability or the elderly trying to get down to that um, gym. Okay. Yep. Fair com fair comment. We. As, as you know, I'm not telling you <coughs> anything you don't know, but we could certainly provide that access via an elevator, but if we want it to be as convenient as possible, we can certainly look at an adjustment on that end of the building that, that keeps it up that great. It, it doesn't change things significantly, so we're happy to take a look at that. I, I, I think to Tom's point, it's an important issue at some of these locations that do have the voting that goes on there. So as we move forward, we'll be continuing to monitor that. Very, very valid. From this yeah. side, on the Conniff. Anyone on this side from the Conniff? To John. Just a quick one. Uh, is there a, an elevator in configuration? Just curious. There is. The el um, John, the elevator in this configuration is located right right here. Oh, that one. Okay. Yeah. And then you don't have, there's, maybe it's typical for elementary schools, there isn't, um, you know, like a, a, a locker room or something of that nature. You typically don't include those for elementary schools? Right. right. TD? So I, I know in the past I, I've been told this isn't the final rendition. Um, but I, I've been just going through and counting classrooms. And I see three flex spaces. I don't see the fourth one. Maybe I'm just missing it. Um, there should be. We've got the, um, we've, yeah, we've, we've got the flex space. The, we've got the, on the very first floor, the entry level floor plan. Yep. At the very top, we've got yeah, one we've labeled health slash flex. And then at the bottom, we've got the one that's labeled flex adjacent to the primary entry. Yep. And then on the second floor, we've got the foreign language slash flex I classroom. <laughs> I just needed Lindsay. I found it. Okay. Thank you. So, so my Lindsay, if you could just a little quicker, just. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she, she was already there. I'm like, OK, I, I got it. Um, so I, I think that, that when, I'm, when I think about population and the fluctuations, um, and I fully appreciate the, the increase to the 20, having the ability to have the 20 classrooms with the two flex equals 22. Um, my concern just is always that um, if we end up with, you know, four kindergartens of 20, which is kind of, you know, we already have three of 20 and we had to move people out of the kind of, um, because of the fact that there is, seems to be a little bit of pressure in that area. Um, that if we end up with, with a, a continual pattern of four, that sooner or later we would not have enough to see that all the way through this, the six grades. Um, so I guess ideally what I would, I mean, I don't know how you would ever make it happen, but to be able to have 22 classrooms with two flex. So therefore, if you ever had a situation where you had to have four classrooms per grade level, you would never be short. That's just my only thought. Okay. I guess, I mean, just to further extrapolate on that one, the when you hit four classrooms at 20, if you try to narrow it down to three, which is, you know, we have larger class sizes in, you know, grades four and five, it still doesn't work out. You're still at like, you know, 24, 25, if not 26. So I just, I'm just always being cautious about that. Yes, if you, I mean, that would occur if you maxed out all of the current classrooms and then you maxed out your flex classrooms and you would, you would essentially have to exceed the proposed enrollment to get to a place where you didn't have that flexibility. Because keep in mind, when we say, when we say the 20 classrooms, mm -hmm. we're talking about 20 classrooms at 19.6, an average of 19.6 students per classroom. And in enrollment of the 385. So even, even if you went to an, an average classroom size of one or two more students, automatically that, en that enrollment becomes, instead of 385, you know, it's 405. So you would, you'd have to max out 
all of those classrooms and your flex classrooms to get to a place where you didn't have that flexibility. Right. I'm just imagining hypothetically in the future if that were to happen, um, just as probably 30 years ago, people weren't thinking that the kind of was going to end up full to the brim. And now we, you know, we've exceeded capacity, so. Sure. And, and I don't, we haven't talked about it in a while, but as a, as a reminder, the, um, we haven't talked about it, I don't think, since early when the school committee and this building committee was sort of taking the enrollments, et cetera. But at all three of these buildings, we have those two flex classrooms mm -hmm. that can be extra program elements for language, science, et cetera, but are really kind of above and beyond accommodating what we're saying is the proposed enrollment, even at 19.6 students per classroom. So we, you do have um, some wiggle room there on those years that you have a few more students. And I'm, I'm not saying that to um, debate the point you made. The point you made is a valid one. I'm saying that to just point out that there is, there has been some really good planning um, going into the number of classrooms at all these schools to make sure that that's not necessarily a tipping point, that you do have a little bit of a cushion. Kelly. Scott, just one thing I wanted to bring up is um, some of the issues that we have at the kind of right now are just that the existing construction doesn't support adding on to the building, which is what we ran into initially. And so just thinking ahead, similar to what Dee Dee's saying, and future proofing, you know, looking at the way that we designed the building so that we could potentially add on at a future date and allowing us that room for growth, um, just making sure that we're not putting ourselves in a corner where we end up in the same spot here in, you know, 10 years. Yeah, I think the, I think the question at the kind of, well, I think the question at all three of the elementary schools, and it's, it's, certainly, it's certainly a good point. We, we want to think about that, and we want to think about whether if we did want to do that, if it means going out or going up, because both are, are possibilities, as you know, Kelly. The, um, but the real question would be, just like we're going to talk about it at the Lowell, we're, we're to a point on the Lowell site where all of a sudden if we propose 470 pupils instead of 550, it becomes a much more appropriate project for that site based on the size of that site and the circulation around that site and the desired open space on that site. We would argue that we may be getting to the point on all three of the sites where if you had additional student population that there would have to be um, you know, significant additional student population. There had to be a fourth elementary school in town in lieu of considering, because there just was so much pushback when we went out to the public about letting these buildings get too large for the sites they're placed on. But both of those are equivalent arguments, I think, whether um, you make sure that if you wanted to do it, you could do it. That would certainly be good planning. And then whether you would want to do it in the future is kind of a decision for later on. And Laurie? Um, yes, yeah, so I'm looking a little bit at flow. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm looking at, you know, we get deliveries every day for the kitchen, uh, the kitchen on the second floor, so that is a little bit inconvenient. Um, there's one door, there's not really a loading dock unless we make the community access a loading dock area, which that kind of changes the look and feel. You can't have a pretty loading dock, or that's very hard to do. Um, and so, you know, bringing, um, you know, pallets in. I'm not really sure where the storage is right now, but bringing pallets in and then bringing food into the kitchen every day, going through a reading area, and then up stories. It, it, it just uh, it makes things, I think, probably a little bit harder um, for the flow. So I just ask that that be looked at. Sure. Our, our goal for that area, Laurie, would be that when we bring in the, um, because on the site, this is a higher area on the site, our goal would be to have a service access, um, which, you know, would I don't want to give the impression that there is a lot of traffic because at the Conniff it's not ex as if there are multiple large trucks traveling this every day. But as you point out, there is a delivery that occurs there, um, certainly for lunch every day. But our goal would be to bring this service access in at that upper level, so that what you would really see 
and it's not definitive in the plan yet because it's um, just conceptual, but what you'd really see is a service dock on the back side of this building and the service area coming up behind it where anybody could come into that area, um, you know, at that second level. Sorry, at that second level right there at that kitchen and custodial area. Um, but we are still taking a look at that. And we also want to make sure that if we do that, that parking for uh, custodial staff, et cetera, all happens back in that, in that zone so that they're not mixed with the front of the building or not trying to bring anything in from the front, front of the building. But we just have a little bit of testing to do in terms of the grading and a retaining wall, making sure it, it all works back there. Large enough to service site the elevator site. absolutely yeah. the, the the great thing about that is if we can pull that off if you imagine something coming in at that level we you would only have to go down either down one floor in the elevator or go up one floor because you're sort of hitting a mid-level point in terms of the service access Sean. Scott is there a risk uh, I only see one elevator Hoist way on this plan. Is there a risk there? Uh, should we think about a separate freight elevator? And then, uh, mostly concerned about ADA compliance and making sure it doesn't go down. Sure. We um, we certainly could int introduce a secondary elevator. A lot of our buildings now, even our smaller ones, have a couple of elevators. So as we take a look at this plan, this plan as it evolves, it, uh, as you know, it's not a huge cost. Um, to introduce that secondary elevator on a project of this size. It might make sense. I think from a pure accessibility standpoint, we could argue that we meet the requirements, but I think from just a good planning standpoint, we may want to take a look as you suggested. Yeah, Andrew. considering that that's the primary right. access for the building, I think it's more appropriate to have some sort of method of getting upstairs directly from yeah. the front door. We, we might want to reduce this one to pure service um, to reduce the cost of it slightly and then um, install a three stop on the at the access point. Yeah. And then we can also limit who goes That's right. The right. The only issue to that would be if there are people that are going to be using the facility after hours that have disabilities, they would have to be able to get in. If you're dedicating that entrance by the gym to just to be open to the public after hours, then you'd still have to be able to get those people downstairs and upstairs. One of the things we often do with an elevator like that is um, make it purely keyed access so that it can be utilized when you want it to be accessible to somebody. But like, for example, during the day, you know, students wouldn't have access to it, um, only the other elevator. So we, we can certainly take a look. I think we can satisfy the, the total functionalities described. Um, Anyone else on the CUNIF from the committee? Anyone in the public wants to talk about, ask questions about the CUNIF? Okay, Scott, let's go to the Hosmer. You have to speak up. You have to go to the microphone, please. I'm sorry, but that's why we have them here. Um, yeah, I'm sitting here and I'm remembering when the CUNIF was so overcrowded and um, that's how I got involved in town meeting, trying to get an addition to the kind of, and I remember them saying that we couldn't go another, the way the construction was, they couldn't put another floor on it, the way it was built, I don't know if that's true, What that's what they told us. But, um, and my son was in a kindergarten that actually, I think they have refrigeration in that room now. But anyway, um, I'm concerned about the playground because I don't think it was official size and I'm wondering now that you're making the building a little smaller, will that increase the, um, the space of the uh, playing field? It, it would certainly increase the overall size of the area available for play space. Sorry. I don't believe it was official size, if I recall. Right. The, the, the very small t-ball field, field that is at the rear of the building is not really regulation anything. You can play t-ball on that field, and we've set it up so that you could continue to do that. Now, we've got this large open, and again, I apologize 
for how confusing, confusing, confusing this drawing is. We're trying to communicate a number of things here. But in this entire area, we've opened this up. We call it open the green space, but we've opened this entire area up. Now, it could potentially be a small soccer field to give you a sense of the size of it. It could potentially have a regulation uh, baseball within it. It could be a lot of things. So we've freed up the area for it. It'll just be a matter of as we move forward deciding if that's really a priority. Um, if you just want to replicate kind of what occurs now right here, or if it becomes such a priority that we want to combine it with some other green space to get a more extended outfill, for example. Well, it was always a concern about it not being regulation, and I thought if this is an opportunity to do it this time. And just for the record, I'm Marilyn Petito DeVianni. Thank you very much. Anyone else on the kind of? Yes. I've got to let the public speak first. How are you tonight? Um, when you started, you said there were some advantages and disadvantages of. Uh, building like this? You've discussed some of the advantages. Are you planning on discussing some of the disadvantages? The only disadvantage is that there will be an incremental increase in cost for proceeding in this fashion. And on our meeting on the 23rd, well, on our next building, at our next building committee meeting, we'll have some of those costs to present. Thank you. John? Go ahead. Oh, yes, sorry. Anyone that hasn't signed in, please, when you before you leave, sign. There's a there's a sign-in sheet. Uh, Carolyn Day, I'm a resident at York Ave. Um, one thing I'm noticing is the orientation of the building, and I agree there are a lot of benefits for this on the site. But in going for net zero or even an efficient school, do you have any concerns about the fact that your main access is north-south instead of east-west? And if it does stay like this, how would you mitigate any glare issues rather than relying on shades for early morning and late afternoon? When, when, we, get to the, when we get to the Hosmer, you'll see that we've got ideal east-west orientation there. On this site, as you, as you can imagine, to go east-west on this site either put us back against the abutters and push the building into the rear or it placed the building along the street and then it had us kind of blocking access to the rear green space um, of the site and in the neighborhood meetings there was a really strong feeling about the benefits of this you know gr green and um, net zero aside, there was a really strong feeling that the right place for this building in terms of the way um, a lot of the neighborhood felt about it was on this property line. So that's why we got it there. I, th I think there are strategies in the, uh, you know, as we've started to consider tonight's meeting and think about um, potentially the possibility of net zero for the kind of in the Hosmer. We've dug a little deeper on research, as you may know, a couple of fantastic reports produced right at the end of last year that studied a number of K-12 buildings across the country that are hoping to achieve net zero or have done so. And East-West wasn't always a, a driving factor there. They were able to overcome it with a couple, uh, you know, a number of different strategies. And so we think for the size of this building, configuration, et cetera, um, it certainly sit, fits within the profile of some of the same size, shape, et cetera, buildings that did have a northwest orientation. So we, we do think those are overcomable, but we're very conscious of the fact that Hosmer is going to have an ideal orientation, and this one's going to take a little bit more work on the east and west facades. Anyone else from the public? John? I'll, I'll wait. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Scott, to move on to the Hosmer. Uh, on the Hosmer site, there are a handful of things that when we take a couple of steps back and we have essentially the opportunity to consider a clean slate, 
that we want to attempt to achieve beyond um, the items that I just mentioned with regard to kind of net zero, it's, uh, you know, energy efficiency, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I'd like to point out what some of those are. We, we wanted to, when we took a look at it, we wanted to think about the parking issue that was raised and think about how we incorporate the dirt, uh, what is, I hate to refer it to it that way, but everybody knows what it is. The, the parking lot is partially dirt that exists um, in this area of the site. We wanted to think seriously about the drop-off issues that have been raised and anything we can do to remove drop-off from the neighborhoods and get it kind of back in a school zone and discourage people from attempting to drop off on the more narrow, busy streets. We wanted to consider the opportunity for consolidating um, and reducing the building footprint. And so we're going to, and we wanted to be conscious of the views. We certainly um, have heard loud and clear that we want to be very conscious about the existing playground areas, the existing fields, et cetera. So all those things were in play as we started to look at the Hosmer site. It has many of the, it, new construction on the Hosmer site has many of the advantages we talked about on the Cunniff. We think on the Hosmer specifically, it has the advantage of us being able to improve site circulation and student drop off around the building. We think that where we struggled on the Hosmer before to sort of define an entry facade and what is the entry facade and, you know, it doesn't feel right if you're entering the building into a corner and is it, you know, which one of the streets is it facing and what's the primary facade and we, we never quite felt 100% comfortable with that. Um, it eliminates the need for some of the large parking lots potentially that we have been showing on the site and then it does the obvious things that we saw at kind of the outdoor open space, reducing the building footprint, envelope, um, better organizational strategy um, allows us to do away with some of the disadvantages of those is existing to remain spa spaces. So those are the, um, there, there are definitely a lot of advantages on the Hosmer site to being able to propose something all new. This just happens to be an image and the only reason we included it is it's, it's that same uh, fisheries and wildlife headquarters building and you'll see with all of the almost all of the net zero buildings, there's a really focus on the interior space and natural daylighting um, and letting the exterior become uh, slightly more functional and uh, sort of task driven in terms of making the building and its operational efficiency as high as possible. This is the <coughs> proposed preferred schematic as we presented to the neighborhood. As I mentioned, there was concern about this large parking area. There was concern about the fact that we really um, weren't doing a lot to change the current drop-off and pickup patterns. There was concern about the encroachment onto the field and how far the ad addition came onto the field. And then um, along with the parking lot was just a general concern about the amount of parking on the site. This uh, just like the kind of drawing, I'm going to apologize. We're trying to show you a lot of things um, overlaid on the site at the same time, but it's important to see them all on the same drawing. So this is the red dotted line, uh, just like the kind of site drawing is showing you the Z-shaped academic building as it exists now for the Hosmer. Um, and you can see the red line extent, dotted line extending over to here picking up the student dining area, the auditorium, the gymnasium, uh, coming around the front to the art room, coming across the front of the build, two-story building where the uh, glass wall exists, and the main front entry to the Hosmer located here, and then the rear entry point and that lobby vestibule being the, the knuckle here. Uh, you can see that existing building footprint. You can see that when we previously proposed an addition, it projected out to here. And it was down at this line right here and came back to the building. 
You can see with this new footprint, we're able to pull it um, slightly further off Concord Road. We're able to pull it uh, back from where the proposed addition was. So we're getting to a much more consolidated building footprint there. It, we're, we're proposing that if we did have the opportunity to place a new building in this location, would, we'd reintroduce a street that existed here before the knuckle connector was put in place. Um, not exactly in this location, but there was a connector street that came through. And we would reintroduce that connecting way on the school property really to do a lot to free up the drop-off and pick-up opportunities because once we have a drop-off lane that comes through the site in this location, continues to drop around on Concord Road, just imagine how much sort of continuous drop-off opportunity you have wrapping around the entire school and you could administrate a policy where drop-off occurs more in those zones and doesn't back in, up into the more congested and more narrow Winthrop Street area. Um, so we think that's a big improvement. We also think introducing uh, some parking along that lane could be beneficial. This could be a road, quite frankly, um, on a number of our school projects where it's controlled access and it's only um, open during drop-off times or it could be uh, continually open for future discussion. This kind of proposal on the site would allow us to ultimately demolish the Z-shaped building and create an open green space in this zone that this building could really front onto because we've got these primary entry areas um, looking right onto that green space. The facade on this side could face Mount Auburn Street um, and be prominent but not be the entry facade. Um, we've pointed out a number of times that it would be problematic for that to be the true entry facade but could certainly have a presence on Mount Auburn Street. We can keep more of the play space. We can capture about 50 spaces uh, utilizing and converting the dirt, dirt lot to a paved double loaded parking area and try to maintain the mature trees that exist there. We could get approximately 23 spaces along the current uh, service access road where parallel parking goes on now. We could maintain all of the views from Winthrop Street across play areas and play courts out to the existing fields. Um, we, th we think that there are just a lot of advantages to that approach, overall approach to the site. In terms of the way the building, that kind of project would be phased, we would, we would certainly uh, need to, if the, if the pre-K, preschool component was going to remain on site, we would likely need to, we would certainly need to deploy um, the modular classrooms to handle that. We can, we can have a discussion about whether that could somehow be absorbed for a short period of time somewhere else um, in the town. But for now, we're assuming that we would need to pr uh, produce a modular school, if you will, to accommodate that preschool, pre-K component. And we have discussed um, with Didi previously and with the administration at the school that if this kind of scenario occurred, things like the gymnasium and cafeteria would have to go back to the old gymatorium that exists in the current Z-shaped building, for, again, for the period of time that this was being constructed, but that that would free up that entire zone for construction and we could do a new building footprint in that location, three stories. Um, the existing Z-shaped building would continue to be used uh, as swing space for the kind of school and the law school like we've talked about previously. And then ultimately that, sp that building would be demolished and become the green space that you saw in the site plan. In, in floor plan, and again, this is just sort of a conceptual slash schematic, but in floor plan, it allows us to create a couple of entry points on this primary facade that is facing the new green space, ultimately the new green space created um, in the zone here. It allows us to cleanly separate 
the preschool pre-K component from the K to five component. So even producing those nice separated entries. One of the, one of the benefits that you might not think about that we've talked about in, in our office regarding this scheme is if in fact at some point in time the preschool pre-K goes out of this building or if in fact some, at some point in time your K to five population grew so much that you needed some more space, this area is so integrated with the overall building that it could easily become additional K to five space and if you, you would only have to find a home for the preschool pre-K in order to get a lot of additional K to five capacity in what is a fully congruent and integrated building. We're, we're showing that in this case, it does, we do have a good east-west orientation for the classroom areas. That means that we're only dealing with the north and the south sunlight. We do have the opportunity to bring daylighting well into a commons area. And we certainly would want the opportunity to continue to consider options and manipulation for this, but it gives us the opportunity for a centralized uh, digital media center um, at the pivot point, if you will, for both of those areas, the preschool pre-K as well as the K to five. It gives us the ability to take the uh, community driven components, the gym and the student dining area and orient them on this side of the building with the student dining area having excellent visual access out to the play fields and the play area and the, the gym conveniently located. We could get um, an entry point, a community in entry point to it up at the top. So a nice overall configuration, clearly administrative control points at the entry for both the preschool pre-K and the K to five school. On the second floor, we would uh, primarily stack classrooms. You can see in this case, um, the pre-K classrooms on the second floor here. You can see the grade one classrooms, uh, music and art on the second floor um, with uh, the second floor media center and media resources also being up, up on this level. And then on the third floor, you can see grades uh, two and three, two, three and four and five all on that third floor level. In terms of massing, you can see again that we're trying to free up and make available um, a large platform for photovoltaics for, for solar panels. We're starting to think about the necessary overhangs and think about the east-west orientation that we talked about earlier and the two entry points and how those would work onto the newly created green space and then the facade along Mount Auburn Street. And then the, the visual connection between the student dining space and the play fields on this corner. And then again, we're just showing some images of the kind of natural daylighting that you want to try to get into the spaces. This is an excellent example of a classroom that was clearly driven by um, environmental in, and energy conscious goals in that you can see they've got the windows up high, windows down low to make sure they're getting natural light as far as possible across, across the classroom. They've also got high reflectant ceiling, ceilings to try to help reflect that light. They've got really high reflectance floor finishes to try to reflect that light. They've got a transom glass going into the hallway and corridor so that that natural light gets transferred even into the corridor. It allow, allows them to use lower lighting levels in the corridor. And those would be the kinds of strategies that we would employ in an effort to get the energy consumption for the building as low as possible. Questions from the committee on the Hosmer? John? Um, I, two different kinds of, of comments. One that, um, looking back on the, on the first floor, I really like th that um, 
the community this is kind of on the community aspect to it where you have as you mentioned the kind of the gym the student dining and really the the digital media lab kind of clustered together which i think creates some great opportunities uh for community use kind of after hours uh, which i think is is a, a, a nice feature um i don't at the kind of that doesn't really exist that they're kind of all separated mm. and so the kind of i can see you know people using the gym uh, but then that, they're not going to probably use much of the rest of the building because the, 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 not, it's not configured in the same way. So I don't know whether that's a, an issue to think about. I, think, I do think that when we go back to the early um, kind of goal setting and planning discussion, uh, you know, in December, January or so, there was some discussion about, you know, trying to make these buildings kind of open to the community and, uh, and kind of after hours. And so I think this one, I think, really does it. The kind of less so, but maybe with a smaller school like that and the configuration of space, it's more difficult to do that. But I appreciate that part. Um, the other point which goes back to uh, kind of the orientation of the building. We had this discussion early on where, you know, does it face Mount Auburn or does it face the, the other direction where you have it now? And I understand your point of, of trying to create that road that goes through and then that kind of creates the, the main access point there. Um, I mean, the alternative, I suppose, you, you could have the, the road go through from in front of the Brigham House and then go straight across there. You don't have quite probably the same length, perhaps, but where you would then put a, a, the front uh, would be facing Mount Auburn. Um, so we had a lot of, we had a fair amount of discussion about that early on when we were looking at other configurations. So, you know, if, if the decision is to made to go with the, the the configuration the way it is now, I guess to me that just makes it really important that the front of the building that faces, the, the part that faces Mount Auburn, like the dining room and that area, kind of really kind of have, a, have an accent to it or a look to it that's going to make it appear as a, as a not the side of a building, but sure. something that's fairly significant. And the other, you, you, you have the Brigham House over on the right there. So, you know, that challenge that you've always had of trying to create a structure here that matches in some fashion what the Brigham House looks like and, you know, in some complementary way. Um, I think that's still, that's an issue when you, I think when it configures where the front of it is to the side as opposed to facing Mount Auburn. Yeah, a, a couple of things there that, are, um, because you made, you made a couple of really good points, Sean. One, one is we did explore when, with this sort of clean slate, we did explore bringing this, which I think is what you're implying with one of your points, bringing this roadway all the way across, bringing it across the front of the building, and what if we had a primary facade on this side and you yeah. come into the building for here and all that drop off and pick up occurs in front of the building. I don't know if that was what you were implying, but that's one of the things we did um, explore as part of this. And we couldn't make the building small enough right. in order to avoid right. eating into a, a lot of the play area. Yeah. So yeah. We, we are assuming that we can make this a, a significant facade that, that it's appropriate to face Mount Auburn Street that I wouldn't say it won't look like the side of the building because it won't look like a primary entry facade. Uh, that would be a little confusing, but certainly we want it to be a nice facade. But I, I don't think we're, I don't think we're in a mode anymore of trying to borrow any cues from the, the Brigham House just because we're in a completely different mode of a brand new building that's clearly going to be 21st century, potentially net zero, energy conscious, you know, all about what's going on inside, et cetera. Um, I think that we're going to try to, you know, complement it in a way that it stands there. We're trying to protect the visual sight lines of it, et cetera. But I don't think that we're, our thinking anymore is that we have to attempt to borrow any of its materials, aesthetic, Etc. And interestingly enough, in the neighborhood meeting and then afterwards, a couple of people came up to us and said, that's a beautiful building, but I hope you're not going to try to 
match it or you know <laughs> pretend to be it or, or anything like that. Um, I, I just thought, I found that a little fast. Julie and I both found that a little fascinating um, when we heard them say that. Well, Scott, you you've um, alluded to the fact of the net zero building, the fisheries building, which is a phenomenal building. I've I've toured it. It's a very dynamic building. Um, some of the problems I know that they have there is the open space in the middle. Um, their workspaces up above are open, as you can see in one of the pictures that you had there, and it's it's a distraction. It, it that doesn't work. Um, I know you're not going to put a trout stream through the middle of our building, um, but that that was pretty dynamic there. But the outside there's a there's a stone moat, and I'm not sure what the purpose of that is. If it gathers. A, a, a piece of that um, is utilized as a rain garden, and so they're using it for stormwater management. I, I don't, I mean, it wouldn't have had to have been in that location. I'm not sure why they decided to wrap it around the building. We may have, as part of meeting the stormwater requirement, the, the town stormwater requirements, we may have some rain gardens on the site. We may have the opportunity to integrate those into the science and the gardening, et cetera. But Certainly, we wouldn't propose to wrap around, wrap them around the because building like that. Too much of it. I mean, loose stones, glass building, young children. Right. Sooner or later, there's going to be a problem there. Right. Okay. Thank you. Paul, this is Watertown. It's going to be an alewife street through the building. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay. Um, I just wanted to say that with both the the kind of in the Hosmer one, when we opened them up to see the insides of these. I was just immediately excited about what they look like. I mean, it's just, it's really cool to see an optimized layout for what an education system could look like for our children in this town. Because with this new construction, like Scott has mentioned, you sort of, you don't have to make compromises or choices based on existing conditions. You're trying to stuff in something that you really want. And as an educator, each page that I open up to see where classrooms are going to be and what stuff looks like, it's exciting and it looks awesome. Um, and so thank you for your work um, on this because it, it, it really does, it, it looks like an education space I'd want my kids to go to. It is very exciting. Anyone from the committee? General public? Uh, Mark. Yes. So, so just a couple, Scott, that, that central core, um, there's a number of classrooms there, so they wouldn't get direct access to daylight. So you've got two kindergarten there and the preschool connections. Right. Same what, thing on the upper floors. Yeah, what we're proposing in both of those locations is that we would be uh, natural daylighting that central zone in a way that they would get borrowed light from that, from that zone. It's, it's one of the strategies that's been utilized in a number of K-12 schools for energy efficiency is to control the daylight sort of once through a common area and a light monitor up above and then bring it into the classrooms through that through that area. So that's what we would propose in those areas. And it's not a requirement that they have direct access? You no. Can, you can do that? General public questions? Yes, uh, Maureen first. I'm Maureen Foley. I live at 10 Winthrop Street. Bravo. <laughs> I love it. If, it if, you, so if you said anything else, I was going to say, wait a minute, this is exactly <laughs> what you wanted. <laughs> I love the road. Look at this. And the drop off, it's everything's great. It's, oh, uh, the other question. Except for. Uh, no, I don't have the <laughs> It's so great. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, to the superintendent's point, can you make, just in case, 40 years from now, you had to go up another floor? Because this is the problem we've had all over town. You can't, the footings aren't strong enough to put another floor on. Just in case. We, we, could, we could certainly design the building to accommodate another floor under the current building code. But there, there are two challenges. One is there is a, a defense, there's definitely a cost associated with that because in lieu of building a roof, we're building a floor 
and putting a roof on it, if you can imagine it that way, and that it's more expensive. The second is there have been attempts in the, and the reason I say under the current building code is there have been attempts in the past to future proof buildings in that manner, and then the building code changed, and what they did structurally to support that extra story is no longer capable of supporting a story under the new building code requirements. So it, it, it's, it's probably something for um, a future, more lengthy discussion, but those are the, the two challenges associated with them. And then the next question I had, if there's going to be um, solar panels on top, how does that affect the snow? Like, does it just melt as it, as it comes down? How do you? As an, as an owner, you can elect to either leave it and, and let it melt off, or you can elect to have a, a clearing pro, you know, program. On a building where we were, would be proposing photovoltaics, we would suggest that the stair, at least one of the stairways go all the way to the roof so there's super convenient access to it. And then it becomes a, a cho an economical choice as to whether you want to gain the power from those, so you want to clear them or you want to let it melt off. In situations where um, cities and towns have done power purchasing agreements, meaning they sell the roof space to somebody else and let that somebody else um, place the solar panels there, it's about 50-50 as to whether they decide it's worth it to clear them off or whether they just let the snow melt I off. I didn't know whether they get too heavy. No, they would have to be, the entire roof would have to be designed to accommodate both the solar panels and the snow loading, no matter what. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Next, Emery. If I don't call your name, it means I, I haven't met you yet. Sorry, so. Good evening, everyone. It's Emery Clinton, Winthrop Street. Um, wonderful plan. It, you took into account so many different comments from the community. Um, I do applaud the plan, so thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions, though. Um, one is elaboration um, on what you said about the module and what, the, what that entails. Um, the second was to echo um, the interior for, well, my question around the interior is, um, the kindergartens that are on floor one, we have many of the constructions that I've seen in hospital designs and building designs are now that office space is in the interior and the maximum use space is always in the exterior. So I was questioning having the kindergartens and a flip-flop with the office space, if that was a doable, well thought about from that component. Just to make, just to make sure I understand, you're suggesting uh, sw swapping which spaces? So it's not suggesting, I'm just wondering if you thought, so the corner spaces on the building and the front of the spaces seem to be all office and administrative space. Oh, sure. Which would be less, I'm assuming the teachers and everyone will be more in the classroom, so it would be beneficial or an advantage to have classrooms more on the corners. Just to echo what was already said in regards to that, that was just a comment more than anything. Sure, we'd want to, I mean, on all of these buildings, because we're just talking about sort of conceptual schematic, just like we've said all along, we would want to have a lot more detailed discussion with staff and administration, specifically at the Hosmer in this case, about sp the location of specific spaces. I will say that the reason a lot of these administrative spaces are on those key entry points and observation locations is, is purely for security and try to keep as many um, adult eyes on approaching visitors, but I, I wouldn't say that at some point in time we might decide to swap some of those spaces to some of that real estate area that you're talking about. So then, and back before the module, um, when you design buildings like this and we um, talk about beneficiary donations and you know, some place like our big uh, commercial partners like Athena or Tufts, and they wanted to donate or put their name on something, do they usually get to weigh in on components of the design? Like when I look at, you know, the media section or the gym, even an elevator as a for instance, does that usually happen? It's, it's, a, it's a tricky question. In the public sector, that rarely happens. Uh, it's talked about a lot, but in the private sector where we deal with um, 
private schools sometimes that does happen in the public sector it, it it rarely happens because of the complexities of it um, when it when it when it does happen in the private sector those entities generally aren't concerned about the design of the building so much as you know ultimately how much signage they're they're allowed but it's sort of a school committee town of watertown complicated discussion okay. yeah. scott we have a policy for that the school committee yeah that we do or we don't do we allow people there, to there, it's, no, it's, there's it's, a policy that regulates it, it it's, okay. there's a lot of complications on, okay. it, 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 that would have to just hoping for donations from our friends that want to do more in the town. Um, and then back to the module, if you could just elaborate, please. Yeah, it's just for the sake of keeping a placeholder and being realistic, we've shown something that would be an eight classroom modular building right here. Not because, and we're, we did that because under an assumption that you'll need five preschool, pre K classrooms and then some support area that goes along with it, hence the five plus three equals eight total. But there's, um, we, we don't know definitively that that's what it would be. That all goes away, obviously, once the, um, once the Hosmer is done, there's a good chance that goes away completely because this Z-shaped building would, would accommodate both the Cunniff and the Lowell, so we don't need those anymore. The town might decide to deploy them somewhere for the high school project or might have another project where they need them. Um, it's hard to say, but somewhat high, conceptual and hypothetical at this point, but that's why they're there. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I apologize. I don't know your name, so. Sure. Uh, Jason Merkin. I'm a resident. Uh, I really uh, echo the other people. I really love this plan. Um, my question is around adding back the through road. Um, <clears throat> so there would be, um, yeah, you essentially have a connector from Mount Auburn to whatever the street behind it is. I don't uh, know the street. Oh, but Auburn. you'd be isolating the green space to the left from the school. Was that in intended to be used by the students? Because they'd have to cross a like a, a lane, a, a, a road with cars that would pass, that would be driving on it to get to it during school hours. And then um, you'd also be essentially adding a road that's right in front of the entrance where kids are going to be sort of walking aimlessly out of. Is that, does that present a safety hazard? Or? There, there are a couple things. When, when we do this in front of a building as a drop-off lane and when it's done as all new construction, it's hard to imagine, but it, it looks quite different from a road for example than a road for example where the little dots you see here we're suggesting are bollards and we're suggesting that this is probably a different material and there's probably no curb transition but there's a big raised table which means the pavement goes up and it's flat and it goes back down again and there's something to control speed through there so you make it very undesirable for anything other than coming into park or um, dropping off. It's, it's, not, it's not intended to be another roadway. And it might have controlled access. You might decide to limit the time periods when someone can actually go through there. Because although most of the, most of the students are going to be coming to this play area or this play area or out to the fields, we don't want this to necessarily be off limits. So the reason for this giant raised table is to make it clear that that's a pedestrian way going across it. So we, we would take a number of measures to make sure it was clear that that wasn't intended to be traversed, just like um, a cut through from Winthrop Street to Concord Road. And I know it's hard to imagine what it would look like with, with my description, but um, the intent would be that it would feel very different from a roadway, but be excellent for additional drop off. Thanks. Anyone else on the Hosmer? Yes. Hi, I didn't introduce myself earlier. My name is uh, Jason Panino. I live on uh, Barnard Ave. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, what is the time frame of, of this project? Is the Hosmer still scheduled to be the, the first to get going as it was you know, a month or so ago when we briefed? It is. We have, we have a schedule we're going to talk about when we sort of move away from 
um, site specifics, but it is still the first one, and we'll show that in the sequence. Yeah, because I was just wondering, uh, I, don't, I asked a number of questions about time frames and length of projects during the last meetings, and I just was wondering, you know, what is the time frame of this? I don't remember the length of time for the other projects off the top of my head, and I was just kind of figuring out how all that put together, and I mean, I really like the idea of new schools, um, I'm, but I'm concerned about the time, and I'm also concerned about the cost of the, the comparison. I mean, obviously, we, I think we all want the best for all of our students, but I know there was a plan in place to kind of fund these schools with various additions, and I just want to make sure that, you know, we, that same, we can still fund, the, fund these new projects that same way. Otherwise, there'll be a huge outcry for, with the rest of the public. Sure, just with regard to the overall timing, and we'll, uh, we'll show it in the end, but I just want to say now why the, why the moment is kind of right. This, the proposed changes that we're um, suggesting as a result of the building committee charging us with this task, none of the changes in the way the buildings would be approached alter the overall construction timeline that, that much. We, you'll see it in the end, but it, it doesn't really alter it that much. And um, just with regard to cost, I don't think anybody um, in the town is any more concerned about that than the people who are sitting at this table, and that's why there's another meeting schedule that will be scheduled to talk about that, so. Thank you. Uh, and just in addition to that, we at the last meeting talked about that a little bit because the delta between what we were doing for additions and renovations and we we asked Scott to do this exercise and again this is an exercise that is being somewhat well received you know there there is additional cost but we as a committee have to look at is that incremental additional cost worth it over a 30 or 50 year lifespan. Oh, I so I get it. I we, mean, yeah. We're going to be discussing the cost at our next meeting. Yeah, no, it's, in, in more detail. Yeah, it's not always makes sense to retrofit, yes. knock down, rebuild. I get it. We have to look at, we owe the community a, 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 the exercise of looking at every possible option Absolutely. at this point. And that's, tr that's what we're trying to do. Thank you. Anyone else from the public? Yes. Hi, everybody. My name is Richard Cohen. I live on Standish Road. My, my kids are out of school. I've been following this process, and I just want to add my voice to the chorus of uh, how exciting it is for me to come to the meeting and just to see a school that is just beautiful and exciting and preserves green space and is energy efficient and is state-of-the-art in terms of what our kids are going to get uh, and, and makes the butters happy. Uh, so if it's even if it is a little bit more money, um, I think it'd be great for our town. I think it'd be great for our kids. I'm just totally excited about this. So thank you for all your hard work. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else from the public? Yes, Peter. Thank you very much. And as a lot of people said, I think it's great. Um, I'm trying to get my head into the softball coach. And I know this might be preliminary. Um, home plate to the building, left field, how far is that? I, and I know, and I know, you know, we has been we could switch it up. I mean, I, I first want to thank you. I think it looks great, um, but that's how my mind works, unfortunately. Um, and so, because originally, before we were thinking about this, there was two two fields here. So I'm sure maybe we could move the diamond to an opposite corner, but it looks kind of tight down the left field line. But I just that was just my only thing. Um, the top lot. It would be replaced someplace in a, in a good area, I'm assuming. I know this is very preliminary. Right. Okay. But I, and the gym size. Is the gym size any bigger? Um, we, we've sized it for a full-size gym with, um, you know, I think three rows of bleachers is what you get in the standard 6,000 square feet. So larger than it is now. You know, the wall right now is on the yeah. what, what should be. Yeah. that out of court line but yes very good so thank you very much I, I think it's it's really nice to see some changes that a lot of people are happy so thank you for the committee and and your help anyone else from the public committee 
John? D just a quick question on the, on the gym. Was the Cunniff gym smaller than the Hosmer gym? It, no. It, same size. Same size. Yeah. Lindsay? I just wanted to make a, a quick comment to uh, Jason's concern about the driveway in, in Hosmer. Lowell has like the same setup right now, and the kids actually cross that street regularly to go to the playground and the field space, and it's a not an issue and it's not gated. Um, and so it's... And it's a real road. Yeah, and it's a real road there too. So. Anyone else before we move on to the Lowell? Okay, Scott, let's go on to the Lowell, please. I'm, I'm not going to reiterate the, um, the neighborhood concerns here because they were remarkably similar to the Cunniff and the Hosmer in terms of preserving green space. I'll just talk through some of the things that we've been able to do. If, um, if we were to just slightly reduce the enrollment proposed for Lowell, it it clearly allows us to consolidate the number of additions, uh, which results in less kind of site disruption, not that the project should be driven by the amount of disruption during construction. There's going to be a certain amount of that regardless. But eliminating the number of additions um, just is ultimately going to make the building kind of more efficient in terms of its footprint, less of a series of uh, add-ons. Um, it makes it a cleaner project, et cetera. It, it certainly will minimi minimize the visual impact that we've, we talked about a little bit last time on the west side of the building. It does a number of things academically that we had been talking with Stacy and the staff at Lowell about for some time now in that we were really struggling with that 550 pupil population to really give it all the same kinds of spaces that the, uh, the Hosmer and the Cunniff had. We were struggling to get small group spaces into some of the existing building. Um, there was a little bit of concern about how usable the student common spaces would be since there were two of them and they were on opposite ends of the building and there was no way to sort of isolate them so it allows us to uh, deal with that. and it. Um, it allows us to, we had previously in all the plans you've seen, we had several of the existing classrooms in the 96 edition that we were keeping at the same size even though they were undersized because we were just so squeezed for space on the site. So with the freedom to remove just those four classrooms, we're able to make those classrooms larger. Um, and it reduces, certainly reduces the burden on the kitchen and dining area, which has always been a concern at the Lowell site. And, and with the, par the parking and less students and less traffic, et cetera, et cetera, I think we all know what that means. So when we took a look at what that would mean to the overall site, you can see we've still got the addition at the rear that it's primarily the fitness center and then some restroom serving the dining area and then more receiving custodial space so that that could take place at the rear of the, of the building. And then we've adjusted the configuration of the addition to the east and we've eliminated the addition to the west. A lot of the remaining site components, um, majority of the remaining site components stay the same. The, the site adjustment in this addition does mean that we're going to adjust this playground slightly, uh, something that we think is easily um, overcome, so not, not particularly concerned about that. But our approach to the front of the building um, and all the other things we've talked about would essentially remain the same. We, we are still looking at, you know, access and entry here. You'll see in the floor plan how we think we may have improved that a little bit, but it's better. Um, to take a look at some of the improvements in plan. We've just highlighted, for example, we've, with, with less demand for classrooms, we've been able to introduce more small group spaces in the appropriate areas. 
Uh, this is an example of increasing the size of an existing classroom and introducing some small group spaces to those classrooms. Uh, we're showing how now uh, the dining space, when you are at 470 pupils and you demolish the rear section of that and increase it by about eight feet, which is what we've always proposed, but at that point it can accommodate the student population in three servings and we don't need the addition that was occurring um, to the left of that dining space. We consolidated the learning commons because in revisiting the programming and vision session goals with the staff and administration at the Lowell, um, a lot of what they wanted was a more consolidated, defined space. So we've talked with them about um, that satisfying they, that need and we think it's very uh, a big improvement for them programmatically still a lot of transparency to the inside of the school and the flow and an open stair and a lot of the great imagery you've seen and some of the conceptual renderings we've done but also a more defined space and probably more flexible overall in terms of all the different things that could be done in there from you know, group presentations to multiple classrooms coming together to um, kickoff activities, um, all, all kinds of different programmatic activities we've talked about being able to accommodate there now with them. And then we prepared this site plan to just demonstrate that even with a slight adjustment to the East Edition, we still got super nice sight lines all the way from the entry point at George Street, up Orchard Street to the, the main part of the building. And it almost makes sense that the building wraps in an L towards all of the visual sight lines from Orchard Street versus something coming off of this size if we don't need that additional programmatic space. And then here, a couple of things that are improvements, at least in our mind, is on the lowest floor level, when we reconfigure this addition, we can bring an exit point right out to the playground area in this direction, um, where it's most likely the students would be going. Um, we can keep an access point here because we still may want to have some limited ability to drop off materials and bring them to the building and bring them around, etc. But we can keep flow on both sides of that area. You see on the main floor plan where the student commons, the learning commons gets located, you can see the uh, dining area addition uh, removed from this floor plan and then you can see on the upper floor how we've got the two-story volume. So if you can imagine on this level being able to look down into that student commons area. And then the phasing plan for this site really doesn't change that much. It's just that the additions are smaller and the timeline therefore the, the amount of time required is adjusted slightly. So nine months for the additions. Uh, seven months for the renovation and then five months for the follow-up site work. And because we had quite a bit of discussion around parking, we did prepare a variety of different options for expanding parking because we know it's likely going to be continue to be a discussion on this particular site, although we think reducing the student population helps that a lot. We, we can, in fact, get um, a number of spaces in this slot. I think I had said six. I think John said nine. He was clearly correct. It's nine spaces total. Um, the, this, we, we might have to have a small retaining wall in that location. But we think that this is, our, this is our favorite scenario for adding some spaces. We did test some other things that we'll point out. If, you, if you're at the rear of the site, this is a little confusing um, because it sort of zooms in on the space. But everybody remembers the basketball court 
and the play field at the rear of the site. We're in, um, let me just go back. to the aerial. We're back here. We wanted to test. It really didn't come up, so I don't want to suggest it was anybody's idea other than our own. But in just trying to leave no stone left unturned, we asked our site consultant to take a look at what if you brought a roadway in back here and did some parallel parking along that, or what if you brought some parking in back here. So the next few sketches you're going to see are just us testing if you could get significant additional parking back here, if you brought something in back here. You may remember we already know we could get a few spaces um, on the upper section of Lowell, although we would point out that by the time you miss the trees and get perpendicular spaces in between the trees, the count between the number of spaces you get perpendicular versus the number that are there parallel, very, very similar, not worth um, the juice is definitely not worth the squeeze in terms of getting the, you know, testing some perpendicular parking there. Uh, well, you'll, we've actually, I think Alex has put a couple of photographs at the tail end of this where we've got some photographs on site that help to show that as well. But um, for orientation purposes, the, the images we'll be looking at are in that zone. And so you can see this is bringing that roadway in at the very top of law and attempting to come across. But the grading gets a little tricky. It slopes off. We'd have to reduce a, a retaining wall along this line here. It's really not wide enough to try to introduce parallel parking unless you went to one way. We've got a little bit of parallel parking here, but you're taking up a lot of green space through there to get a few parking spaces to us wasn't particularly attractive. We're particu we are certainly willing to explore it further if the committee thinks it's a possibility. We took a look at just dead ending a small parking area behind the field and behind the bleachers there. Um, it's, it's a lot of impervious surface for the amount of parking it provides, but it does provide you know, 12 spots here and four spots um, as parallel spots in this location. It's worth taking a look at the photographs uh, because if you, if you look at, we're at the upper end of George. I think I said Lowell earlier. We're at the upper end of George Street. So um, you can see there that we could cut in a few, but you eliminate the um, you eliminate part of uh, in order to get between the trees. You're going to have to cut in a few, and then come back here and cut in a few, which is where that last photo was taken. Then maybe cut in one in there. Just it becomes not worth it, and you have to deal with a slight slope up the hill, and perhaps pulling in a little retaining wall. It's a lot of activity there, uh, and not much of a net gain in spaces. This is that area where we would be able to introduce, we think, some parking spaces along low that runs behind the school. Um, you can see the field in the background there, the basketball court over here, just for orientation purposes. This is just showing, we did take a look, but over here the slope is, is going away too quickly. Um, we might gain one or two, but the slope quickly becomes too much to try to put parking on it. And this is that zone behind the field where we had the small parking lot with the parallel parking spaces on this side and the perpendicular on this side behind the bleachers. Um, so we take full responsibility for any complaints about that investigation. It was just and purely an exploration on our part. So we'll take we're, we're not going to discuss those options here this evening. <laughs> <laughs> Gave us something to think about. Right. Comments from the committee on the Lowell options at this point. <laughs> Lindsay. Hi. Um, <clears throat> the uh, the one thing I just sort of stood out to me in terms of um, 
this layout and design in terms of how it looks, and even compared to the previous design that had sort of more learning commons spread out. I understand the, the goal of wanting one big one. Um, I guess what I would be concerned about is that all the small group spaces, while they could be really cool, I feel like it's going to be really dependent on our choices of furniture and design in those small spaces, so they don't turn into like a conference table and nobody wants to do something there, right? So like I just think that we have to be really careful to make sure those spaces are utilized. Like I kind of think about like the, the grade four wing or they're down the end and they're so far removed from all the other common spaces like the media center and the learning commons and the maker space and stuff like when are they ever going to get to have a cool place to hang out and learn that's not in their classroom and I think that really is dependent on our furniture and design choices inside those small group spaces so they have other places to go. I sort of one of my big appeals throughout the whole educational visioning process about modern education spaces that kids need different spaces to learn and I just want to make sure we're thoughtful about that because um, this design, because it's an older building, we're not introducing these big open common places that everyone's looking in on and, and we don't have that kind of feature. Um, and so I think having those spaces will be important for the kids. I would agree. Yeah. Tom? To Lindsay's comment, the extension of the dining area that you eliminated, could that be a learning area? It's, it certainly could. Access to it would be through the cafeteria. Um, we, you know, we could take a look at getting an access point through the remainder of the building in that, in that zone. I, I would say give us a chance to, to chat more with the administration and whether that, that space wasn't nearly as large. Just by sense of scale, it was about half the size. The, the addition to the cafeteria was about half the size of this learning commons. And one of the things that has come along with this consolidated learning commons is a large enough space to put, for example, an entire grade level for an assembly. And as we, um, and I'm not trying to speak for Stacy, but as we listened to um, her staff and administration and we talked about the visioning sessions and sort of what serves them the best, getting those spaces consolidated, even though they might be a little bit more of a travel distance for um, students on the other end of the building, became so much more valuable in the number of things they would accomplish for their educational program. Stacy. So um, Alex came out a couple times over the last couple months and we really had the teachers get involved and when we did look at the learning space um, commons on both ends of the building as, as much as the thought of them seemed like they were going to work for us, when we really looked at the amount of space we were going to be able to, we probably couldn't get more than a, maybe a class and a half in there that had that openness, whereas this will, the teacher said if we want to get together as a grade level, we want the whole grade to get there and have enough space to do so. So that's kind of why we went to this. Um, and they were really most concerned with having that ability to be able to meet the needs of their students by getting into smaller groups, be, um, um, and having a place that could be a, potentially a little bit quieter, and they really focused on um, needing to have those areas not be taken away from us. And because a lot of the students and the teachers felt that, you know, the teachers felt the students weren't able to actually learn in a completely open environment. Any other comments, Paul? Scott, um, where are we with the, par the number of parking spots realistically without the fairy tale? Lots in the back. Um, adding along Lowell Ave seems realistic. Um, what do the numbers look like with? I, th I think scale? that I think we're still at a deficit of 12 spaces. No, I'm sorry, because we're still we're working to see if we can. When we remove the dining addition, we thought maybe we could preserve some of those spaces back there, and so we don't know for sure if that's a possibility. If you assume we could preserve those, then we're only at a deficit of about 12, 12 spaces over what's on the site now. Any other questions or comments from the committee, the general public? Peter?
Thank you. I wish I had my red magic marker. I, I'd give you a nice F for that uh, thing. The only negative thing I'll ever say to you, you guys are usually on top of it, we put a batting tunnel in that area probably a year ago. So those pitches out back behind the softball. Plus, if anybody's ne been next to a softball, baseball game, you get a foul ball, it's going to break the windshield. So, so thank you. Um, I'm not overly opposed as long as you don't move Mr. Whitney's boulder to try to get some parking there because it doesn't look like it impacts <laughs> the parking too much. Um, I guess my number one question, one of the low parents asked me, I don't know why they asked me, but why are the other two schools new? I mean, this is just a general question you don't have to answer, and then we're trying to fix this one. Just a question. Um, the other thing in terms of you're going to keep it this plan, the, the top lot in the front is old and antiquated anyway, so that wouldn't be a great loss. One thing I'm a little perplexed for, it seems like we're ignoring this, and I had my engineer friend go down to the bottom of the park there on the Orchard George Street side. He said you could fit about 40 spaces down there with a minimal retaining wall making it a nice area. And I don't know why we're not looking at that area. So the, the, the corner, uh, the right corner down there, the corner of Orchard and Lowell, it's relatively flat, the right corner. Yeah. Orchard and George. George. I'm sorry, Orchard and George. Yeah, thank you. That base corner, a nice rectangle park, and he said, now he's an, he's an engineer, uh, without a lot of, without a big retaining wall, you could put 40 spaces there. Your friend is correct. You, Thank you. you. Why aren't we look? I, I, why are we avoiding that area? Is it a is it a visual thing or? Plus it, the other thing is if we, I don't want to get into other parking areas, but I'm sure that I'm sure the overflow from the DBW and you know maybe the overflow from Victory, so it might solve some issues. Thank you. We, we've let me try to answer that. We. We're still keeping all options open, but the intention of this committee was to keep as much of that green space as possible intact. But as you can see, the parking situation is still extremely fluid. So I wouldn't close the door on that option at this point. Any other questions or comments from the public? Yes. Good evening. My name is Hi Guz Markarian, Carlton Terrace. Um, I'm really glad that uh, that addition on the side wasn't um, pushed through. Um, but I was, I was late to the meeting, but I saw the Hosmer School. It was a beautiful school, nice flow, and you know, that's what a school is supposed to be. And we're still putting money into this 100-year-old um, this school where there's been one, two, three, four, like five, six additions already on it. And maybe we cannot spend money on this school and <clears throat> concentrate on the two schools. And then in 20 years or 10 years, we could come back or five years and go through a federal grant and get money from there and fix the hot, like knock the Hosmer, uh, I'm sorry, the Lowell down, move it forward maybe a little bit, and you'll have the proper parking in the back. and the proper egress for the neighbors, and it will be a more of a nice flowing school that will be good for 50 years, you know, or 100 years. Um, maybe you could look at that option also before we spend money in this school. And, um, but because if you put this school and the Hosmer School, the layout together, and you look at it, it's just, it's not, it doesn't flow, you know, it's just add-ons. And, you know, I think that that will be a good idea, too, if even if we have to build another floor on the Hosmer going up to the, the fourth story and maybe putting more kids in the Hosmer school or the Conf and not into the uh, Lowell. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing none, anyone from the committee? Schedule the next steps. So, uh, sorry, for Mark, Shane, you, yes. So, so to, to sort of come back to the, uh, the grade configuration and the enrollments, um, 
Have, have we looked at the, the, the program and what, what might not be in these options that were in the other ones? Uh, for instance, the, the Hosmer has, has the auditorium now. We would be eliminating that. I think the Conifer one time had a, a black box studio. Looks like, looks like that's gone. So have we done sort of a comparison of what, what was in before, what's not in now? The, the only items are the, um, would be the at the Hosmer, we have not included the auditorium, the program. In the Conniff, the black box theater was the music room at the, the Conniff, so it wasn't a, a separate space. But I should have pointed out that programmatically, we did not assume that we would replicate the auditorium. We did that for, for a couple of reasons. Certainly, we could look at a program that includes it, but we we very, very rarely see an auditorium in elementary school. And when, if we're going to build those two new, then it seems it does raise a question if the Hosmer were to get an auditorium and one of the other buildings doesn't. It's also a very expensive space to build. And it, in sort, and not that, not that energy efficiency is driving these projects. But any space like that that's occupied so little and is so large um, is a detriment ultimately to your energy efficiency. So, and in, in even talking with the Hosmer staff when we were programming, the actual amount of use they get out of that uh, space is very, very, very small. So, so, so I think yeah, I think we're going to reschedule the next meeting, but maybe between then and now and then, you know, we can. Update the, the space summaries and yeah. just go through with DD just to make sure, sure. We're, we're still like for like. Yep. So, item number four and number nine actually tie in together. Our next meeting is going to be on January 23rd here in this room because the zoning board was not meeting. And Scott, did you have anything else on your next steps other than at our next meeting we will be discussing costs? which will be taking up most of the portion of the discussion. And as to Shane's point, we'll go over what programmatically, including like the auditorium, what we may not be getting in these two new facilities if we go that route. Any other comments, Scott? No, I, th I think that our, uh, we'll, we'll also continue to advance the, uh, the designs and any refinement that we may have before that meeting, we'll, we'll present that as part of the cost. Our goal would be um, to certainly sort of understand the consensus that the building committee is still very much interested in this, all, of course, pending the affordability, and that if, um, if that seems to be um, in alignment, maybe at the next meeting, some direction on proceeding or not with these concepts. I, we would be actually adding an agenda item to make sure if we choose to go this route that we would have to actually vote to request the town manager to request the town council um, to continue down this path um, once we get a handle on what the costs are going to look like. So there are a couple other things that are going to go along with the cost. We have comments again this evening about the Lowell School being torn down. You know, I think we need to consider some of those things. It is a historic building, which creates some situations um, in tearing down. But um, there are a lot of things that we're going to be considering as we move forward. Keep one wall. Keep one wall. I don't think the historic commission would be very happy with that. <laughs> Did you have a comment? No. Will there be um, exterior design? No. At the next no. No, these are just schematic designs. That's the next steps. These are very preliminary. Um, community outreach group update? Uh, nothing to report. OK. Now, I, I guess Scott and Shane, we can dismiss you at this point. Not that we don't want you to stay, but the next item is something that we have to deal with. That's your scheme, by the way. High school update. Do you want to begin with just an update, Didi? Yes, thank you. Uh, so the exciting news that we have to share with the community is that on December 12th, the MSBA board um, voted to invite us into the feasibility phase of the high school project. 
Um, and that is definitely a great step for us. Um, and the first step in that is um, what they call module two, which is selecting the project team. Um, so that is the stage that we're in right now, which um, will probably occupy the next six months of time with the project. And we're looking forward to moving into feasibility. I want to thank the people who went with us to the board. That was a great meeting. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for your comments. Um, the next item is 6A, which is a formation of an owner's project manager selection committee. Do you want to go over the MSP a requirement, DB, please? Yep. Um, so in terms of uh, the next step, uh, the school building committee has to authorize a, um, an OPM selection team, a selection committee that would go through the process of drafting the request for services, um, would then submit that in terms of an advertisement for um, proposals, then would review the proposals that come in, um, you know, set the criteria that we'd be looking for in terms of selecting the OPM, um, interviewing the um, responsive proposals, um, and then making that final selection. Um, and at that point, um, either on April 1st or May 6th, depending upon um, how we work through this process, um, we would take our recommendation to the MSBA OPM review panel, and then they would make sure that we went through all the proper steps and did our due diligence, and then we would select our OPM. So those are the next steps. Okay, and the, the MSBA is requiring or suggests that we vote on this, and the OPM selection committee will consist of Superintendent Galston, Heidi Perkins, Steve Magoon, Tom Tracy, Kelly Curlbaum, Laurie Cable, and Peter McLaughlin, the building inspector. So can I get a motion to approve the selection committee? So moved as presented. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. I guess, Dee Dee, you can coordinate. Excellent. Yes. The, the sooner we seating. get started, there are some template RFPs that they ask you to look at. As soon as the sooner we can get this process moving, the quicker we can get it reviewed by the MSBA for the high school. Thank you. Review of invoices. Mr. Tracy. Um, I'm passing out a um, quick spreadsheet that I put together today um, showing where we are with uh, expenditures to date on this project with Daedalus and AI3 Architects. Um, on the bottom, I'm looking for approval for two invoices for Daedalus projects, um, one for twenty, one for $13,000 for um, period endings October 31st and November 30th. And then um, for AI3 Architects for the period ending 1231 in the amount of 28,158.99. I don't, I don't like to make these comments, but I'm a little concerned that we're just seeing this for the first time this evening, and I would appreciate some explanation as to how we're here and why we're here. I got the invoices this afternoon. Okay, so my suggestion is we put these off until January 23rd so that we can have a, a little bit of a time to think about this. I appreciate that, and uh, I'm going to suggest that we table this until January 23rd. Mark, it yes. might be helpful just to quickly reiterate what they're contracted through right now. So they're contracted through you know, the end of SD, um, right now they're billing 98, 93%. Yeah. Just, it might be good to just overview that as we're prepared to review further. Okay. Any other comments on the invoices? Um, I just, in the past, if we, we actually provided copies of the invoices. But, but we we'll we'll get everything together for the committee. Any other business for the, the, this committee? Any other questions or comments? Any pe member of the public? Can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. All those in favor? <laughs> Aye. Aye. I guess everybody, well, we can stay later. Everybody, everybody, really wa want. everybody wants to stay. Thank you. <laughs> Happy New Year to everyone.